Welcome to the Healthcare IT Today CIO Podcast. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and I'm excited to bring you the most practical healthcare CIO insights and perspectives. We know your job is challenging and we want to help you be more successful. And today's guest is Dr. Lee David Milligan. He is the CIO at Asante Health System. Welcome, Lee. Morning, John. Good to see you. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've known you so long on Twitter, so it's, it's fine to, <laughs> I think it's the first time uh, really face-to-face, if you don't count Twitter face-to-face, so I'm excited to, yeah. to have you on, the, on this episode, and for those that don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and Asante Health System. Yeah, so Asante is a, a three-hospital system in Southern Oregon. We draw from about nine counties in Northern California and Southern Oregon, about 100,000 ER visits uh, per year. Uh, Between three hospitals, we have just shy of 700 inpatient beds and been around for about 85 years. Uh, A lot of focus on quality. And for the last 10 years in particular, we've really zeroed in on quality as kind of our our brand. Uh, It's a great health system to work at. As for myself, I'm an ER doc by background. Uh, Went to George Washington for med school and then UCLA for residency in emergency medicine. I consider myself a recovering ER doc uh, (laughs) at at this point uh, and got into technology about 12 years ago. Um, with uh, actually going back to school in an attempt to kind of learn something about computing in anticipation of what was happening in the health system. Mm. And kind of one thing led to another. Our system began the selection process for an EHR. I got involved in that, and then it kind of cascaded. I've been in my current role as CIO for a little over three years here at at, uh, Asante, and it's been a terrific gig. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, we've had a number of recovering uh, CIOs on this uh, podcast. So, you know, recovering ER doc, eventually you'll be a recovering CIO. Is that double recovery? I don't know how that works. <laughs> Dual diagnosis. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, well, yeah that's, a, that's a challenging diagnosis. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it's interesting you talked about the focus on quality. Are there maybe, you know, two or three top technologies or, or even efforts that you've, you know, been through that are are really making an impact on the on the patients in your health system? Yeah, I mean, we found traditionally that really um, culture and workflows are what drive quality, but we can influence those heavily through technology, whether that's through our secure messaging system that we leverage uh, tremendously, it's called Halo, or uh, how we build out our instance of Epic. We have our own instance of Epic. We've been on Epic since 2013. We also extend our Epic to a number of uh, local clinics as well as an entire other health system. Mm-hmm. Um, and But we build it out in a way, we attempt to, that helps support those underpinnings of the workflow that drives the quality. So I think that piece is big. There is a fair amount of technology coming over the horizon that's gonna be helping patients in other ways though. I think about uh, wayfinding, for example. We're in the process right now of adding Um, 360,000 square feet to our flagship hospital. We're about halfway through that that project. Ribbon cut on that is kind of mid-2023. And we're putting great technology in there. Um, Wayfinding is one of them. Um, We're also really building out our digital portal for patients. Uh, If you have to go in there to just, you know, renew your medications or make an appointment or whatever you need to do, really doubling down on that investment has been huge for us. Um, We just launched two cancer centers here in Southern Oregon on January 17th. We're working on it for three years. And we put some really amazing technology in there, linear accelerators, PET scans, CT, the whole nine yards. And it's so great to see it actually functioning and patients (laughs) being cared for there after, you know, thinking about it and planning for it for so long. So a lot of good stuff happening. Yeah, I've done the new building. That's a lot of work, uh, but it, it's it, it, oh, you're yeah. right. It's so rewarding when it's done and you're in there and you're like, wow, this worked. <laughs> like, what? Wow, it actually worked? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's interesting what you said about the portal. You know, my argument was the portals are useless because we didn't provide anything of value. It wasn't uh-huh. because people don't want to use a portal. I mean, how many portals do I go to? I go to my bank portal. I go to, I go yeah. to all sorts of portals in my life uh, because they actually provide useful functions. So I, I think sure. that's the challenge. Yeah, for sure. And what we've, what we've discovered is that there's a number of operational pieces that have to be in place for that portal functionality to actually deliver value. So mm-hmm. one example of that would be direct scheduling. So mm-hmm. if I want to see my doctor I'm established with, I want to make an appointment, I don't want to call somebody. I don't want to be on the phone and go back and forth. I want to be able to pull it up, two clicks, I made an appointment, I'll be there on Tuesday. And But to do that, you've got to get all of the operational folks to line up on what it means to have a follow-up visit with an established patient. 
Hmm. What's the timeline associated yep. with that? And is that uniform? And so pulling the operational pieces together prior to the technology layering on top has really been the, the, the hard part. Yeah, that's the hard work. How about the messaging system? You talked about your Halo, uh, your mm-hmm. use of the Halo product. Was that about kind of connecting the dots and streamlining the communication or did it replace some systems that weren't working effectively or what was the value that was created there? Yeah, the, you know, prior to this is 2015 when we first started diving into this space, but at the time paging, you'll recall, yeah. was that was Still. the norm back then. And the, the machinery and the, the pages themselves were antiquated. And even some of the manufacturers were no longer even repairing them when they broke. Yeah, so we true. recognized the industry was actually dying. At the same time, I was worried as I was CMIO at the time, I was concerned about the possibility of images or information being mm-hmm. shared through SMS texting, because doctors, you know, they get the job done. They got to yep. find a way to get the job done. So we really wanted to find a solution that would replace the pagers and at the same time ensure the confidentiality of the information. And so we, we did a vendor selection process, went it on Halo. I'll tell you, I'm personally very happy with the selection. They've been a terrific partner. We've kind of co-developed a number of things uh, with them and it's been uh, a terrific ride. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, I've, I've run into a number of doctors who that I was like, well, how'd you send that image to your other doctor oh i just texted like okay <laughs> like, don't, don't tell your hipaa privacy officer that but of course it's a small clinic so they're like whatever <laughs> yeah. yeah it really it continues to be an issue in the industry um i'm really happy that we have this system in place and you know our system it's pretty cool because not only do we have it in place for the clinical side Mm-hmm. but I use it for my team. So oh, okay. uh, previously when there was an issue with the network or the telephones go down or something, we'd have to call internally what we call a derp, basically bring everybody together to be able to have a meeting and talk through it. Now we actually solve 80% of those issues through a distribution list within wow. Halo. And we just text about it until we get the right person on the job and then we fix it. Occasionally we have to call a derp and actually get together. But 80% of the time we, when we look back, we're actually fixing it with Halo. Wow. Powerful. How about a, from a doctor and nurse perspective, we talk about from the patient perspective, but what are, what are some of the top technologies or, or efforts you're doing to improve? I mean, we know doctors and nurses are burnt out. So what, what are yeah. you doing to help them? Yeah. On the burnout front, I would say um, we're not down this road yet, but I anticipate in the next year beginning to just do discovery on ambient speech. Mm. So I feel pretty strongly that ambient speech combined with command and control of the EHR is a really powerful tool um, for our providers and for patients. You know, I think about, you know, right now what it takes in order to be able to find the information you need as a provider is laborious, right? So for example, if I see a patient who's got elevated creatinine, you know, one of their uh, measures of the kidney function, Uh one of the questions I'm going to ask myself is, is that new or has that been going on for a long time? And if it's going on for a long time, What's the trajectory? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it about the same? Do I have to do anything about it? So the ability to look at the EHR and say, hey, whatever, um, bring up the last five creatinines of Mrs. Smith and graph it, and then have the EHR be able to do that for you, that is powerful. Because then you can, you can spend your time, instead of looking for information, actually doing something with the information. So that's probably number one. Um, I would say the second piece that, um, we're making preparations for right now is procedural telehealth. So we've done a lot in the space of cognitive telehealth where, you know, either doc to doc or doc to patient talking through issues, perhaps Mm -hmm. examining through video and whatnot, but we haven't done a lot so far in the space of procedural telehealth. This is the concept of ORA being connected to ORB and being Mm -hmm. able to have, you know, a surgeon here speak to a surgeon over here and have that surgeon with perhaps more expertise or more credentialing they'll provide guidance on the actual surgery in real time. Wow. Pretty powerful stuff. And it's happening in a number of places right now. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is, does it need to just be your organization? Are we going to see that expand across health systems and partnerships that way? I mean, the technology is there. Who cares if it's your own? But I mean, there's some business reasons, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, I I totally agree. I think both uh, use cases can happen. I think there's a, there's a, a hub and spoke model perspective Mm -hmm. that can be used. So you have maybe a a university setting where you have super high expertise in an area, speaking to somebody who's in a smaller town who can provide that expertise during a surgery. You could also use it for credential. You know, to get credentialed in a procedure, a surgeon Mm -hmm. has to watch the procedure 10 times um, and then has to do it while being proctored. 
And in today's world, they got to travel different places and whatnot to make that happen. This could bring that whole world together. Yeah, that's interesting. So are there any problems or, or challenges you're facing? Of course, we're all chasing, facing problems yeah. or challenges. Is there, is there something you're, that you're looking at and you're like, wow, I haven't figured out a solution yet for this, but it's, it's a problem we need to work on? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the one I would mention, I think that comes to mind when you, when you ask that question is uh, something we've partially solved but we have a long ways to go. Okay. And that is prioritization. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, you know, unlimited desires <laughs> and, and finite resources. And so the delta between desires and resources is, uh, is pretty steep. Um, and we only have so many attention units we can put towards things to get things done. And so coming up with an effective way to be able to identify out of all these things, which ones are most aligned with our strategic initiatives Mm -hmm. and objectives and then how do we then get the teams to focus on a and not on b we have a pmo process in place the project management office okay and and my team uh has kind of self-organized their work into three uh buckets of work three prioritizations portfolios uh the first is the the project portfolio so anything that's project related the strategic bucket strategic portfolio the second is we call it the business bucket and that's really really business requests that we get from a variety of governance committees. So we have mm -hmm. like a physician advisory committee and mm -hmm. they create a top 10 list of things they want. We have a mm -hmm. nurse advisory committee and they do the same. We have a, it's called, that's called NAC and PAC. And then there's Pharmac, the pharmacy team that prioritizes mm -hmm. their work. So all those asks fit into that second bucket, the, the business bucket. And the last bucket is the IT bucket. And that's reserved for the stuff we have to do. So server upgrades or replacements, patching, um, upgrading of uh, certain applications, all that stuff really has to happen. And prior to us kind of calling that out, what we found is that the prioritization of the, the portfolio associated with strategy, they didn't realize that that work had to happen. So they mm. thought we had this much availability when we really had this much. So by calling that out and saying, this is a separate bucket, it takes X amount of time, that time is not available for this stuff. They have a clear understanding of what's really possible given that space. Yeah, I love the division. I think that's the reality was first is knowing what requests there are, <laughs> but yeah, I love how you divided right. it because it does create, there's different priorities for those things. So a fascinating way to approach it. Uh, you know, one of the other big challenges I, I hear from a lot of CIOs, uh, I think we had a prediction at the Chime Forum from Jimmy Weeks of this is, as being one of the biggest topics that we're going to be discussing in 2022 is what people are calling the great resignation. You know, I think yeah. we've been dealing with some of this challenge of retention and recruitment in health IT for a while. But, you know, how are you working to combat this great resignation and, you know, and, and really kind of retaining your workforce and recruiting new people. Yeah. I mean, first, let me say that I want to validate what you just said. It's, mm -hmm. it's the number one priority I have. And I've messaged that to my team. It's my number one priority. And I'm trying to be a student of this because mm -hmm. I don't know that I had any kind of expertise in how to recruit and retain folks. <laughs> um, so I've really been learning a lot and reading a lot and talking to people and I've been doing things that we haven't done before. So for example, we have a university here called SOU, Southern Oregon University, about 5,000 students. They have a great computer science department. So about six months ago, I connected with their um, division head. We had a great conversation and that led to some additional conversations. And ultimately we created a partnership and a connection where some of my leaders actually lecture within the university now. Wow, that's and, cool. some of, and some of their students actually come to uh, Asante um, there's something called a capstone project that their seniors yeah. do. And so we have a capstone project going on right now where th their senior students are actually building out a, a desktop dashboard for InfoSec nice. uh, wow. for, for us. So there's going to be value on both sides. So either way, it creates this pathway between us and them. Um, I also think that, you know, this work from home thing is real and it's here forever. But 85% of my staff work from home, not all of them, not biomedical engineering and not desktop services. Sure. Some of my HIS staff uh, as well have to be on-prem. But the other 85% are at home. So we're right now working on how do we, you know, if they're going to be at home, how do we keep folks connected to each other and mm -hmm. to their leadership, despite the fact that there's this geographic uh, disparity? One of the things I've done on that front is um, I started, this is kind of, sound kind of weird, but I started doing it and we'll see where it goes. Uh, and that is uh, office hours. 
okay. just like you're back in college. Yeah, yeah. And I launched it literally a week and a half ago. It was really fun. It was really fun. It was an opportunity for folks to just stop by. We can just have a random conversation. I'd say about half of it was just non-work related stuff, <laughs> um, really fun stuff. I actually asked people what their, what their worst job ever was was my wow. opening kind of icebreaker. And uh, man, did I get some interesting answers. I was going to say, as long uh, as they don't say this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's what I said to them. I said, unless it's this one. <laughs> unless it's this one, make it up. <laughs> no. um, the, the other thing is, you know, we're, because we opened up to work from home, we're now in 12 states. Wow. And I fully expect to expand to all 50 states uh, before, before it's all said and done. I'm also trying to focus on culture. And, you know, that... We, you know, you, see, you hear that a lot. Like, what does that really mean? For me, I, I boil down to four things in terms of what I have to get right as table stakes. Mm -hmm. The first is uh, compensation. And I got to pay people. It's, it's a topic of discussion right now because everybody can go different places and make a lot sure. more money. Uh, but you got to pay people enough that you take compensation off the table as a sticking point. Yep. Um, the second is um, balance. Right? How do folks find a way to balance all this work they do with the rest of their world and their life? The third is flexibility. So how can we be flexible to kind of meet their needs, whether they have childcare or, or other need or school? Sometimes the schools close down, the kids are home from yep. school. How do we be flexible and recognize that they're really trying to do this work and we can work with them to accomplish the work, but also they can meet their home needs? Uh, and then lastly, professional growth. We've really doubled down on professional growth. Um, I've asked my leaders, to coach their staff, to identify what their um, long-term goals are, and to help them map that out and be really their partner in mapping out what their future looks like. We've done smaller things like um, LinkedIn Learning, for example, that the team mm -hmm. loves. Um, and then I talk about it a lot. And on top of all that, I, I do some mentoring with uh, folks within the division as well, because I really feel strong that the professional growth piece, if you don't invest in folks, um, they'll look at it transactionally, and then the next person that comes by that offers $1 more an hour, they're going to be gone. Mm. Now, those are some great points. I think the challenge is building the culture remotely and the, the relationships between the different people. I think it's something, like you said, I think we're still discovering. I mean, ironically, I, I've been remote the whole, you know, the time I've been doing it and our team is remote. So, <laughs> You know, but I, and so to me, it really is just making that concerted effort. Um, yeah. you know, I, I think that's also, you, you know, the other one I like, uh, just to throw an idea your way is the idea of retreats, right? You know, like specific times where you create specific experiences yeah. and memories. Uh, yes. It kind of pulls from marketing Dan Heath, he calls about peak moments. You know, when you go to yeah. Disneyland, you don't remember the long lines and the expensive stuff and the parking was terrible and it took forever to get there. You remember the peak experiences, that moment where your kids smiled when they saw the princess, right? Or Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. so, you know, that's, a, I think that might be a way to think about it too. Yeah. You know, before the pandemic, I did hold a couple of uh, full day retreats with my leadership team, uh, directors and managers and myself. The first one I went to a cabin up in Grants Pass, spent the whole day up there, a friend of mine's cabin up there. And it was actually a really uh, great bonding experience. The second time I took uh, the entire team on a hike. Wow. <laughs> we went to a place called Roxy Ann and hiked the whole thing. At the end of the hike, it's a little bit Pollyanna. At the end of the hike, I had, my wife was kind enough to partner with me on this and she had brought all these drinks. So we had Gatorades, you know, ice Gatorades and whatnot. And then I had an article uh, on team building that we all read in the middle of the woods. Wow. And then we came down and then we had the rest of the the, uh, the day within our center here, but it was actually a great experience, but the pandemic, unfortunately, hit us squarely like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's bonded us in other ways too. So there, there's something to say about that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Good and bad. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, I always love to ask for some career advice for those that are listening. Uh, you know, is, is there something that you wish you could have told, you know, a young Lee David Milligan when you started your career in health IT? Uh, buy Apple stock. <laughs> uh, but besides that, no, I, I had a really uh, odd uh, trajectory. I actually, I don't know if I ever mentioned this, if we talked about this before, but um, I actually graduated from high school with a 2.0 GPA and got kicked out of college after my first year. And I spent wow. a few years trying to figure things out. And I had a, a number of random jobs. Um, I worked for Beacons Corporation. I worked uh, at The Gap. Um, I worked uh, at a law firm called Latham & Watkins. 
uh, in their uh, as a clerk in their um, mailroom. Um, and I eventually landed at a summer camp in California called Camp Cuyamaca. And that camp had kids with muscular dystrophy. Mm. And that experience with kids with a uh, health issue was my first real exposure to children with health issues. And it was a completely uh, earth shattering experience for me. And I finished that summer, went back to school, really determined with what to do. I don't know that I ever would have found that determination had I not had that experience. Mm -hmm. So the reality is I probably wouldn't change a thing. Mm. It's what I needed to find my mojo and uh, to be motivated to do the work that I do. Interesting. It's amazing how you had that experience that changed your perspective. Uh, it seems like everyone in healthcare has some story about how and why we're here because yeah. there's certainly easier ways to yeah. make money. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, this was excellent. I appreciate you uh, joining us for this episode of the CIO podcast and thanks everyone for watching. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcasting station and like and subscribe and also check out all the previous episodes at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, John.